We'll now move to question time and I'll call Senator Gafsch. Thank you very much, President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. In a press conference on November 25, 2022, the Prime Minister said, we're operating as a mature, orderly government. Minister, this week the government tried to rush through new immigration laws with virtually no scrutiny, is engaging in secret and opaque consultation processes on religious discrimination legislation and has tried to paper over its disastrous family car tax aimed at the country's top-selling vehicles. Minister, how is this chaos and dysfunction consistent with operating as a mature, orderly government? Uh, thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Wong. Well, I'm pleased to take a question from Senator Cash. Oh, the... Senator Cash. <laughs> Senator Cash. Whoa, that's a slight overreaction. Order. I was Order. going to say. <laughs> Order. Order across the chamber. Minister Wong. I'm pleased to take a question from Senator Cash, who, who is this week. Uh, that teamed up with Senator Shoebridge as the new interesting political alliance. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Cash Shoebridge Alliance, the Dutton, the Dutton Bant Alliance. Order. Order. I mean, this is new in Australian politics. Order. There, wa there was a time, there was a time Order. where the party of government. I mean, uh, seriously, uh, within a few seconds, I had to call the Senate to order, and then the Senate immediately went. Crazy. So let's have some order and some respect while Senator Wong answers the question. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, President. Uh, as I said, it does say something, doesn't it, Where, when you have the Dutton opposition uh, lining up with uh, Adam Bant, Mr Bant, Senator Cash order. lining up with Senator Shoebridge uh, to ensure that Failing to, in order to fail to ensure that Australians are kept safe. So let us be clear, order. because I know there are those who are more sensible on that side. I know there are. Uh, that what Senator Cash in her and Mr Dutton, in their desire uh, to team up with the Greens, have done is made sure you are standing in the way of us making Australians safer. That is what you are doing. So I want to be crystal clear about this. Uh, you can Senator yell all you Daniel. like, Senator Cash. You can yell all you like, but the, this, this opposition, led by Mr Dutton and pressed by Senator Cash, because I know there are others because of conversations that were had on your side who were more sensible, I know that, uh, that you, that you uh, are standing in the way because you think you, you will win a political fight uh, of Australians being safer. Yeah. So let us be clear, that is what you are doing. Uh, and after you get out of this place and all of, all of the flurry Order. of victory with the Greens has faded, the hard reality is the Liberal Party and the, the, the National Party are standing uh, in the way Minister, of the Australians time for being, being has more expired. safe. Senator Cash, first up. Uh, no. Uh, no. Order. Senator Ayres. Order across the chamber. Senator Cash for a supplementary. Thank you. And on, the Feb on February the 12th, 2022, in relation to religious discrimination, the Prime Minister said this. What we will have is a proper consultation process. Oh. Minister, many religious groups are either still in the dark about what the religious uh, discrimination legislation actually contains or, alternatively, have been gagged by the Attorney General of this country from talking about it. How is this a proper consultation process and why won't the government just release the legislation for all to see. Thank you, uh, Senator Cash. Order, order, I'm, order. I, Senator Cash, you've just asked your question. There's so much disorder, I can't even call the minister to respond. So, orderly across the chamber, Minister Wong. Oh, I'm just waiting for Senator Cash to finish, President. Minister Wong, you have the opportunity. Senator Cash, Senator Cash, I did not. Senator Cash, I would draw your attention. Order, order, order. Senator Watt and Senator Wong. It is my role to assign the Senator Cash. It is my role to assign the order. I did not call you, Minister Wong. 
President. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's in, an interesting uh, approach from the deputy leader uh, uh, of, the, of the opposition here in this place. But I, I would again say this. Uh, whether it's on uh, cost of living, on tax cuts, on energy, on Medicare, uh, on cheaper medicines, uh, on ensuring the energy transition uh, is undertaken, on uh, delivering the first budget surplus in many, many years, yep. uh, all of these things we are a, a government that does take uh, very careful decisions, methodical decisions in the interests of the Australian people, uh, which you can't uh, be Minister said. Mark, which can't your seat. Uh, just a moment, Senator Cash. I haven't called you, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. As a point of order in relation to relevance, this question was specifically in relation to religious discrimination uh, legislation and uh, gagging faith leaders from talking about it. Uh, thank you, Senator Cash. I will draw the minister to the question. Minister Wong. There was a lot of hyperbole, as there often is, when Senator Cash gets very worked up. Uh, there was a lot of hyperbole uh, which I was responding to. Uh, and on religious discrimination, uh, I can recall uh, this debate uh, being a very difficult debate, including inside the coalition. Uh, wow. Well. Uh, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cash, second supplementary. The clock's run down. Yes. Yeah. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Uh, thank you. And will the minister admit that the chaos, dysfunction, and total lack of transparency on display this week is emblematic of a prime minister who has made many promises to the Australian people, but time and time again has failed to keep them? Uh, thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Wong. Well, the answer is no. Uh, but if I might finish the response on religious discrimination, because it's a serious topic, and it's a topic, it's an issue uh, which was difficult inside the coalition. And I acknowledge Senator Sharma uh, and others, uh, including in the other place, and former right. uh, members uh, who took uh, you know, a, a position of conscience on that vote, on, the, on those issues. There are, there, these are uh, challenging uh, uh, issues that need to be addressed respectfully Order. and carefully, uh, and we are seeking to do that. Uh, and I would remind you, uh, Senator Cash, that you are part of a government Order. that failed to deliver on religious Senator discrimination be precisely because you were not prepared to deal with it in a dignified and principled and respectful way, and you sought to play politics just as you are now. Just as you are now, and as we always know you will, Senator Cash, you and Mr Dutton. Uh, we know that you will always uh, go thank the you, Minister Wong. Right thank you, you Minister. Can. The time for answering has expired. Senator Pratt. My question is to the Finance Minister, Senator Gallagher. Yeah, yeah. Today's monthly consumer price index indicator shows inflation remains steady at 3.4 per cent in the year to February 2024. So, Minister, this number demonstrates that the government is making progress in our fight against inflation. Can the minister please outline to the Senate why these numbers are an important marker of how our economy is tracking? How will the numbers factor into considerations that you and the government are undertaking as you finalise the May budget? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the question and for her interest uh, in the budget and uh, about our nation's economy. And it is, uh, we can see from today's monthly CPI um, data that it does show that inflation was steady at 3.4 per cent in the year to February 2024. This was below market expectation and inflation remains as, at its lowest level in over two years. So we are seeing uh, inflation moderate and continue to moderate. We've got real wages growing. We've got low unemployment. The monthly inflation is much lower than the 6.1 per cent it was at the election. And quarterly inflation is now at 0.6 per cent, a third of the 2.1 per cent we saw just before the election. This data shows that inflation was higher under the former government and it continues to moderate under us. We are Order. seeing, uh, well, it does, Senator McKenzie, so you look at the data and it does. We're seeing a return to real wages growth. We're seeing near record 
levels of low unemployment. Of course, when we look at our budget, we've got our gross debt is lower, our real spending growth is lower, we've got inflation uh, moderating across the economy. We're not complacent, though, and we recognise uh, that people are still doing it tough. We've got Thank challenges you. facing our economy with global uncertainty slowing growth, and we know and recognise those persistent cost of living pressures that exist across households right across Australia. So our budget will be one that balances the fight against inflation with the need to grow our economy. Uh, it will look at uh, continued relief from cost of living measures without adding to inflation. It will, of course, have those tax cuts rolling out from the 1st of July, and we'll be looking at the opportunities, whether it be in energy transformation, human capital, or the care economy, uh, with a focus on investment for a new generation of growth and prosperity. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. Thank you, and thank you, Minister. Cost of living pressures are front of mind for Australians. You and the Treasurer have said that the tax cuts will form the centrepiece of the May budget, putting more money in the pockets of people that more, putting more of the money that people earn back into their own pockets. How will the federal budget continue to support Australians facing pressure on their household budgets? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. Thanks, Senator Pratt, for the supplementary. Well, the senator is right. Labor's tax cuts will be the centrepiece of the May budget. All Australian taxpayers will get a tax cut because we want Australians to keep more of what they earn. And, however, we also recognise that cost of living pressures are still being felt right around uh, the country, and we will do what we can responsibly in the May budget uh, to support and ease some of those cost of living pressures. Uh, any extra help, of course, we'll look at how we target that, um, whether it's responsible and, of course, affordable across the budget. We've already, of course, invested in making electricity bills uh, cheaper with the e energy bill relief, uh, making medicines cheaper, making it cheaper and easier to see a doctor, making childcare cheaper, expanding parental leave, building more social and affordable ho ha homes fee-free TAFE, and of course we've got wages rising at a fastest rate in a decade, including importantly for minimum wage workers. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you, and thank you for that insight into the important work being done by the Albanese government into pre preparation for the budget. Can the minister please explain why it is so important to have responsible economic management for the people of my home state of Western Australia? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the supplementary. Well, in the Senator's state of Western Australia, one and a half million Western Australians will get a tax cut from the 1st of July under Labor's tax plan. 1.2 million of them will be getting a bigger tax cut. 90 per cent of Western Australian tax women who are taxpayers will get a bigger tax cut, and the average WA taxpayer will receive a tax cut of $1,504 which uh, provides an additional $800 extra into their pocket than they would have received under the former government's plan. Of course, we are in a position to reshape these tax cuts because of our careful economic management that we have undertaken since coming to government. And I'm proud of the work that's been done today. We do have gross debt lower than when the Liberals were in charge. We have real spending growth lower, inflation is lower, and of course we've delivered the first budget surplus in 15 years. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. As we conclude this parliamentary session, the last before the budget week, Australians continue to do it tough under the Albanese government. Labor productivity is down 5.4 per cent over the past 18 months. Real net disposable income per capita has fallen 7.5 seven per cent. Personal income tax collection from Labor is 23 per cent higher than it was before the election. Labor income from self-employment has fallen by 8.4 per cent over the year. Almost one million Australians are now working two or three jobs. Petrol prices are up 4.1 per cent for the year. Education costs up 5.1 per cent. Insurance up 16.5 per cent, while Labor keeps spending more. Minister, as these figures demonstrate, Life isn't easy under Mr Albanese, and it's getting harder for many. Why are Australians worse off today than they were before the last election? Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 Minister Wong. 
Uh, I'm very happy to answer a question about economic yeah. performance. I'm very happy to answer a question about an unemployment rate of 3.7 per cent and record numbers of new jobs since coming to office. I'm very Order. happy to answer a question to remind those opposite that we have the lowest gender pay gap on record and record women's participation. Well, I'm happy to answer a question about the fact that we are ensuring that wages are moving again. I mean, from a party that opposes, opposes increases to the minimum wage, a part, from a party that opposes uh, in, uh, increase to the minimum wage for the lowest paid workers in Australia, want to talk to us uh, about Australia's doing it tough. I mean, give us a break. A party that opposed. Uh, our plan to ensure we, we, we delivered energy price cost relief that you voted against. You want to talk to us oh, yeah. about Australians doing it tough. I mean, Australians must look at you and think, what a joke. What a joke. You talk about cost of living and yet you oppose every measure that we have put in place to deliver cost of living release to working families. And then you have the gall to come in here and say, oh, woe is us. I know we don't want increases to the minimum wage. Oh, woe is us. I know we don't want uh, cost relief uh, for energy prices. Oh, woe is us. I know we don't want cheaper medicines. But it's really bad, this cost of living crisis. I mean, really, you have oh, no yeah. credibility when it comes to the economy. You have no credibility when it comes to cost of living. You vote in here over and over again against every measure this government has in place to address cost of living, and you come and you, pr you, oh, you yeah. cry crocodile tears, crocodile tears, when all of, when everyone in Australia knows. Those opposite Thank you, Minister. Their time has expired. Just a moment before I call you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt. Order. 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 Senator Birmingham, please. I, yes, time was up. Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. I will come back to you. To all of those senators that I called by name who were yelling across the chamber, including you, Senator McKenzie, you are being incredibly disrespectful. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. As members and senators leave this place today, a household with an average mortgage of $750,000 is paying $24,000 a year more in interest than they were when Labor was elected, with no sign of relief on the horizon. Mr Albanese has broken promise after promise, including his promise to cut electricity prices by $275 and his insistence that he wouldn't touch stage three tax cuts. Has the Prime Minister forgotten his promise of cheaper mortgages and cheaper electricity? Has he? Uh, order. Senator Birmingham has the right to ask his question in silence. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry. Well, I, they needed to be quietened down anyway. Um, Minister Wong, just be. Uh, mi hang on a moment, Minister Wong. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan, I think that was you who whistled. And if it wasn't, I apologise. But whistling in the Senate is absolutely inappropriate. If it wasn't you, Senator O'Sullivan, I apologise. Order, order, order. But someone on my left whistled. It is absolutely inappropriate. I'm not going to have to stop and call the chamber to order every few minutes. Order on my right as well. Order, order. I'm waiting to call Senator Wong. Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Well, uh, as, as we leave this Senate chamber, one truism still holds true, which is that the Liberals always want you to work more for less. Yes. Right. Yeah, that, is, that is their position. And, what, and you know what, else, what, you know what other, what other uh, facts hold true? Uh, first, we have the Leader of the Government of the Opposition in the Senate actually complaining about the tax cuts again. I mean, what that shows, doesn't it? What that, oh, it's a broken promise. It's a broken promise. Well, you know, the, here we have a, a, one of the most important oh, yeah. cost of living measures that the government is undertaking, that the parliament has backed, that you backed, and you're still complaining about it. What does that say? Uh, if we leave the Senate, we will remember that cheaper medicines are opposed by those opposite. As we leave the Senate, we will remember that energy price relief opposed by those opposite. As we leave the chamber, uh, increases Order. to the minimum wage, we will Senator remember Rustin. opposed by those opposite. Senator Rustin. 
Uh, Senator Birmingham, sec uh, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Financial comparison group Finder found in a recent survey that one in five Australians have no savings. 76 per cent say they are stressed with their current financial situation, and many will run out of money to pay the mortgage by year's end. How is it that people have got it so good, as Senator Wong wants to stand here and say, and why does the Albanese Labor government have its head buried in the sand when it comes to delivering on their promise to get cost of living uh, under thank control you, and Senator mortgages Birmingham. down? The time for asking has expired. Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Uh, uh, first, I want to say we, we on this side absolutely and clearly understand that, that so many Australians are doing it tough, which is why we were so clear about the importance of putting in place a tax package which delivered more to all Australians, uh, to every Australia, that every Australian taxpayer, sorry, I should say, that delivered a tax cut to every Australian taxpayer and delivered more to working families and to people on average incomes. Uh, something that you are still complaining about. We understand that Australians are doing it tough, which is why we wanted to put in place energy price relief, and we were opposed to that by you. Yep. We understand Australians are doing it tough, which is why we believe uh, that people on minimum wages uh, should have a wage increase, also opposed by you. Mm -hmm. we, wanted to, we, we know Australians are doing it tough, which is we wanted, why we wanted cheaper childcare and fee-free TAFE, and to strengthen Medicare, to strengthen bulk billing, uh, and all of the measures that we have in place. Order. Uh, and instead, uh, uh, and what we are met with is Senator continued Henderson. opposition by those opposite. Uh, they are uh, crocodile you, tears the which have been cried on the other side. Expired. Uh, Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Finance, and it's about the ongoing PwC scandal. A secret legal agreement has allowed PwC International to take control of PwC Australia following the tax leak scandal. We've learned that for, for nine months now, five faceless global figures have exercised sweeping powers over the Australian firm that we were not even aware of. PwC International is hiding critical information from the parliament about who did what in the PwC scandal, making a mockery of our Senate committees and escaping real accountability. We must bring these shadowy partnerships to account and hold PwC accountable for its actions. What steps will your government take to address this appalling and disrespectful treatment of the parliament and the Australian people? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, um, President. I thank Senator Pocock for the question and for um, the work that she has been doing, along with uh, Senators uh, O'Neill and Senator Colbeck, uh, in this space. Um, I think initially I would say to you that we are the government is very interested in uh, the work that the Senate committees are doing, uh, and looking forward to your report and any recommendations that you have. Um, I would say that there are, you know, at, at, as the Senate is aware, powers within the committees um, to seek information and, of course, um, leave it to the committee to, to look at whether there is any further work that they can do there. In relation to what the government is doing, um, we have been doing uh, quite a lot of work to strengthen um, you know, some of our arrangements around uh, engagement of consulting firms. Uh, and we've talked about this at estimates. Um, I think we have learnt a lot about through the PwC issue that's been examined by various Senate committees of uh, further work that we need to do. I would say that some of the origins of the investigations have related uh, to a breach of a confidentiality arrangement, not a breach of sort of procurement processes, but what it has done is led us uh, to look at what further work we can do to strengthen integrity uh, within our procurement processes around the use of consultants and contractors. And we've been doing that uh, through our strategic commissioning framework, through our efforts to reduce the reliance on consultants and contractors, uh, and some of um, the further arrangements that we're looking at in relation, I think, some of the issues that have arisen out of confidentiality, out of conflict of interest. Um, arrangements that may, may exist that we are doing further work on. But we are very much looking forward to the report and the recommendations that are going to come forward from your various inquiries. Uh, Senator Barbara Pocock, first supplementary. President, PwC International is defying requests to cooperate with Senate inquiries. They refuse to hand over the Linklater's report, which names international partners involved in the tax leak scandal and explores what they got up to. 
It's time to up the ante, Minister. It's time to use a bigger stick. Will your government ban PwC from all commercial interactions and work with others to ban them from all levels of Australian government? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I think the answer to that is, um, well, we're not looking at that. We're not looking at banning them, um, uh, PwC as an individual uh, company or contractor. Uh, we are interested in a general sense of looking at how we can enhance um, the integrity uh, of the uh, engagement the Commonwealth has with suppliers. So we are looking at uh, and we are developing up a Commonwealth Supplier Code of Conduct, and that will outline behavioural standards that are expected from suppliers during procurement processes and while under contract. Um, so this is something that we're looking forward through prospectively. Um, but um, you know, some of the work that was done around the original PwC uh, tax practitioners board issue and the advice taken through that. Um, you know, was was not about being able to end any contract with PwC. That, that wasn't available to the Commonwealth. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. Partnership structures used by the Big Four hide all manner of sins. They have up to 1,000 partners and are subject to very little regulatory oversight. The opaque big partnership model has failed us. Do you commit to replacing it with a more regulated corporate structure? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. I think this is one of those. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Pocock for the supplementary. I think this is uh, one of the areas where I'm aware that committee inquiries have, are, being look, are looking clo closely at structures, uh, and it is one where we will await uh, your work. I mean, we're doing. Um, you know, we have done some thinking around it, but we will certainly look for your, your um, committee's recommendations. Or there is a number of committee inquiries underway. We would. Uh, Look at that and any recommendation it may make, and then provide a response uh, through that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Ciccone. Thanks a lot, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Last week, the, uh, yes, it, 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 it is the last sitting day. Um, last week, the Albanese Labor government announced Australia's uh, build partners for the conventionally armed nuclear powered AUKUS submarines which will be ASC and BAE systems. How does this demonstrate the enduring confidence the government has in Australia and particularly South Australia's shipbuilding workforce? Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Ciccone for his question and for his work as chair of the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs and Defence and Trade Committee uh, and his interest uh, and engagement on uh, national security and defence matters. And he is correct. At the Osborne Naval Ship Shipyards last week, the Deputy Prime Minister and I were joined by counterparts from the United Kingdom, by Ambassador Kennedy uh, and by Premier Malinowskis. And we announced that the government has appointed ASC and BAE systems as our sovereign submarine partners to build Australia's AUKUS submarines. This will see a joint venture established which will bring together the skills, knowledge, resources and capabilities of these two partners. ASC has also been appointed the sovereign submarine partner for sustainment and maintenance of our AUKUS submarines. It will sustain the conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines in Australia, including in the lead-up to and throughout Submarine Rotational Force West in Western Australia. Uh, this is in addition to the central role ASC currently plays in sustainment and maintenance of Australia's current Collins-class submarines, including the Life of Top Extension being carried out, to be carried out in Adelaide. I had the privilege when I was Finance Minister of being a shareholder minister of ASC, and I am deeply proud of the work that management and the workforce did uh, to uh, get uh, that firm uh, and that workforce to the level of expertise uh, to deliver the outstanding outcomes that they have delivered uh, over, over the years. There will be about, uh, some 4,000 Australian jobs in the design phase and construction of the yard for the new submarine, 5,500 during the build of the submarines, and over the next years we estimate that over $30 billion will be invested in Australia's industry uh, to deliver AUKUS. Uh, our build and sustainment strategy is a further step in the Albanese government's commitment uh, not only to strategic strength, but also to a future made in Australia. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. Thanks a lot, President. And thanks for that comprehensive answer, Minister. 
Uh, Minister, I do note that you have spoken before, as have many others, about the increased strategic competition in our region. Why is AUKUS so critical to the peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific? Minister Wong, first supplementary. Thank, thank you, President. Thank you, uh, Senator Ciccone. And, and Senator Ciccone is right. We do live in a much more challenging strategic environment, uh, and uh, responsible governments uh, do have to look at what is the best way to assure Australia's interests uh, in a very, in a very, in a rapidly changing world. Uh, and our belief is that uh, Australia's uh, best, uh, fo uh, Australia is best served where we have strategic balance or strategic equilibrium in our region. Uh, we also are always motivated uh, to seek peace and stability in our region, and we, uh, in that vein, are open and transparent about our acquisition of nuclear-powered conventionally armed submarines, uh, and uh, as the IAEA Director General has welcomed, uh, we, we believe these submarines will transform our ability to deter or respond to any future threats, and most importantly, to change the calculus for any potential aggressor. Strategic balance means we must ensure that no, think no country will ever assume uh, Thank that you, the Minister, benefits the of conflict outweigh the expired. risks. Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Thanks a lot again, President. And uh, last one for the week for me. With reference to uh, the Minister's comments, with reference to the Minister's comments about her visit with the uh, Minister for Defence to the Osborne Naval Shipyard last week, with the UK's Foreign and Defence Secretaries and US Ambassador Caroline Kennedy, how is Australia working with our US and UK counterparts on AUKUS? Minister Wong. I'm making sure they're awake. It's a bit quiet over there. Great final question. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank, Thank you. Well, Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom are uh, self-evidently united by many things, including shared values and our shared interests, although I can say, after attending a footy game with them, that maybe AFL is not one of them. We all want to promote a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific in a region which is peaceful, stable and prosperous. Uh, and the AUKUS submarines, by design, will incorporate technology from all three nations. From all three nations. Uh, our military, Australia's military and civilian personnel, will embed uh, with the US Navy and Royal Navy, and through Pillar 2, AUKUS partners are deepening cooperation on a range of self security and defence capabilities. Uh, we are working together to ensure each nation is equipped to defend against rapidly uh, evolving threats. Uh, we are pleased, uh, very we are very appreciative uh, of uh, AUKMIN being able to take place uh, in Australia and particularly. Uh, the visit Thank to you, Adelaide. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hanson. Thank you much. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer to the Code of Conduct for Ministers, Section 1.3, Part 3, published in June 2022, personally signed by the Prime Minister, which states that ministers must accept they are accountable for the exercise of the powers and functions of their mm -hmm. office and ensure that their conduct, representations and decisions are open to public scrutiny. Why is the Prime Minister failing to enforce this principle, deliberately withholding draft legislation from public scrutiny and requiring non-disclosure agreements be signed before stakeholders can scrutinise these proposed laws? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, in relation to the first part of the question, uh, yes, uh, I acknowledge the ministerial code. Uh, I, uh, not, I don't think the question actually went to any aspect of that other than the second part of the question, which related to uh, draft legislation. Senator, you didn't say which draft legislation you were referring to, so I'm not sure what. Well, order. I'm just. Order. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, which legislation you refer to, Senator. Order. 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 To members of the opposition, this is not your question, but in any event, you should be listening in respectful silence. Minister Wong. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Senator. If it is the Religious Discrimination Act, and I assume, uh, uh, given uh, previous discussions, it is. Uh, the advice I have is, is this. Uh, 
Obviously, there's been a long discussion on religious discrimination. I think since 2016, there have been 10 inquiries, over 260 hearings and consultations, and 70,000 submissions. Uh, I understand that there has been targeted and confidential consultations, which is not an unusual process. The advice I have in the brief I've been provided with is that no stakeholder has been asked to sign an NDA in relation to the religious discrimination bill. If order. Well, uh, no stakeholder has been um, asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. If I'm incorrect on that and the advice I've received, I'll certainly come back to the chamber. This is a difficult bill. Uh, as you know, it's had a long period of, uh, uh, of discussion. Uh, th these matters were first raised by, I think, Prom Prime Minister Turnbull or Prime Minister Morrison? Prime Minister Turnbull, I think, originally, and then Prime Minister Morrison as well. Uh, we are conscious of the importance on something such as religious discrimination of trying to engage in this uh, discussion in a way that is respectful and where we seek to bring Australians together. I thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Thank you very much. I refer to commentary about the so-called Nature Positive Plan by economic expert Robert Gobleidson, published in the Australian newspaper two weeks ago, and I quote, the Albanese government is embracing some of the worst practices of dictator-driven governments to conceal controversial environmental measures. He also referred to stakeholders being required to sign NDAs, which is non-disclosure agreements, to see just part of this plan. Does the Prime Minister believe this conduct is compatible with the principles of the Code of Conduct of Ministers? Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, I'm assuming that, well, Senator, you asked first about religious discrim discrimination. Now, uh, about the EPBC reform. That's sorry. Uh, Minister Wong, no, please resume your seat. Me. Senator Hanson. Relevance. I never mentioned the religious discrimination bill at all in any part of my question. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, Minister Wong. No, you're quite correct, Senator. I, I inferred that from the interjections, and you nodded when they interjected, so I assumed that you had that's the legislation you were referring to. If you were referring to the Nature Positive Bill, which I think is the EPBC uh, reform, uh, I understand that consultation on drafts of the new laws is continuing, uh, that uh, there is broad, a broad, broad view uh, that there is a uh, you know, we need to, to, to deal with laws which are seen by many as ineffective and inefficient. Obviously, people's perspective depends on which side they are in that discussion. Um, the, uh, the advice I have is that experts from, about, from almost 100 groups uh, are examining draft parts of the legislation to make sure that the laws will be effective as possible. Uh, and we'll keep, we will keep engaging. With uh, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Never answered that question. Actually, I referred to NDAs being, NDAs being signed and no reference to that whatsoever. With nine bills guillotined in the Senate today, four strewed with no debate or scrutiny, bringing the total of guillotined bills to 96 in this parliament, the Prime Minister is acting like a third world dictator. When will uh, the Senator Prime Hanson Minister withdraw that comment? I withdraw that comment. When the, will the Prime Minister resign in disgrace for his failure to uphold the principles of Australian democracy and the code of conduct? For ministers, which bears his uh, signature. Thank you, Senator Hand Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, well, Senator, uh, I, uh, I and this and this government uh, are we are a, a party that believes in democracy and participates in the democracy. We are democratically elected government. Order. Minister, please. Uh, we we we. Uh, are a democratically elected government. Uh, we work with the parliament, including in a chamber. This chamber work. Senator Rustin. Uh, Senator you... Rustin, you are being incredibly disorderly. The minister is still speaking. She's got 32 seconds to go. If you have so much to say, I invite you to participate in taking note. Uh, minister, did you complete your? Minister, did you complete your answer? Minister Wong, did you wish to continue? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we do believe in uh, making sure this institution uh, works effectively. We don't have a majority in this chamber. 
Uh, the Senate has made decisions. I know that you, on some of those occasions, were on the other side, just as we were on the other side when uh, you voted with the government on uh, the previous government. Uh, and I would, I would simply make the point. Uh, and any Senator, Senator Ruston, are you something wrong here? Senator, uh, Senator Watt, Senator Watt, order, order across the Senator Cash, and Senator Cash. That's right. All of you should be listening in respectful silence during question time. That's exactly right, Senator Cash. Uh, Minister, did you finish your right, answer? Uh, so, Senator, uh, obviously, uh, we, I disagree uh, with the way in which you've formulated the question. Uh, uh, thank we, you, Minister. We, we don't the have the numbers in this chamber, and we work with the... uh, Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. In February last year, the Prime Minister announced $250 million to improve community safety in Central Australia. In February this year, we learned that $10 million of that funding was, had been allocated for better digital connectivity in Central Australia. Minister, how did better Wi-Fi help protect the Alice Springs community last night? Uh, thank you, Senator Nampajinga-Price. Uh, before I call Senator Wong, I'm not going to have any interjections. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, and obviously, uh, um, Senator Gallagher might be in a position to answer in a little more detail uh, in relation uh, to uh, this matter. I, uh, can I say first that uh, uh, the uh, you know, violence has no place in any community in any part of Australia? Uh, and, uh, uh, the Prime Minister and the government uh, works in partnership with the Northern Territory Government, uh, and uh, our expectation is that uh, that perspective, that violence uh, is unacceptable in any community, is something uh, that all of us can, can work towards. Uh, we, um, I understand uh, that the Prime Minister uh, has engaged with the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory. Uh, and emphasised the importance of prioritising community safety. When it comes to broader issues facing Central Australia, I think, as you would know, uh, Senator Nampajipa Price, there are no quick fixes and no simple solutions. Uh, we have a four-year plan to improve community safety and wellbeing in Central Australia, which was de de developed with uh, the Aboriginal Leadership Group, who is providing advice to the government on what will improve outcomes in Central Australia. Uh, we want to see action in partnership with the community uh, and long-term solutions uh, to health, education, jobs, housing and justice. justice. In relation to the specific question about, I think as a program that had been announced, why a decision was made to allocate some of that to connectivity, I will seek advice, Senator. Uh, and if I have something further to add, I will return to the chamber uh, or I'll provide that advice to you. But I would say this to you, that obviously connectivity is a very important part of enabling economic development. Uh, and enabling the provision of health, health uh, of services, uh, and I think we see in many parts of regional Australia that uh, that lesser connectivity leads to poorer outcomes, both social and. Thank economic. you, Minister. The time for answering uh, is expired. Senator Nampajinka Price, first supplementary. Well, connectivity doesn't work if people are dying. I note 40 million has also been allocated for on-country learning in Alice Springs. Will that education account for parts of traditional? culture, such as payback, that has contributed to the violence and disorder in Central Australia. Thank you, Senator Nampachinka Price. Uh, I once again remind those on my left there will be no commentary. Minister Wong. Um, uh, thank you. First, uh, can I correct the record? I think I, I misread a brief and said that the Prime Minister had spoken to uh, the Chief Minister. I'm advised that it was, in fact, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Uh, so, in my previous answer, if I could correct the record. Uh, in relation uh, to uh, uh, the, the broader issue, as I said, violence is unacceptable and unacceptable in any part of Australia. Yeah, violence is unacceptable wherever it occurs, in any community. I'm also advised that the Northern Territory Chief Minister has uh, announced extra police for Alice Springs, uh, which obviously that that's the advice I've received. If, if there's something different, Senator, I'm, I'm very happy to listen to you. Uh, that's the advice I have received. We, we, we do have uh, the Northern Territory Government uh, obviously has a responsibility to ensure that community safety is prioritised, but we also need community leadership. 
Thank you, Minister. Senator Nampton Price, second supplementary. To agree, we do need community leadership. We need leadership across the board. Will the government respond to the Mayor of Alice Springs as a community leader who has requested for the federal government to step in and assist in restoring law and order in Central Australia? Uh, Minister Wong. Well, we are working with the Northern Territory government uh, hand in hand. Uh, our expectations are clear, as are the expectations of community, and, and uh, we are providing additional funding and support. Uh, in the ways in which um, the, minister, the senator is aware, uh, and our position is to continue to work in partnership with the NT government. Uh, senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Communications Minister. Last week, it was revealed by Channel 7's The Nightly that telecommunication companies in Victoria are charging for information desperately needed by police to search for murdered Victorian mother Samantha Murphy. Not only were they charging the police for this information, they were delaying passage of it to the police. A former Victorian homicide detective told the Nightly that police faced financial, legal and technical barriers in their attempts to access phone data. As Victorian Shadow Police Minister said, and I quote, delays in investigations are devastating for the families of victims and to think anyone is profiting whilst families suffer, suffer is appalling, end quote. A mother is missing and the telcos are charging the police to help find her. How shameful is that? Is the minister aware that the telecommunications companies are, are slow to deliver vital data that could help with police investigations? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, President. Thanks, Senator Lambie. I am aware of the reports that you're referring to, uh, and if those reports are true, that, of course, is of great concern, I think, to all Australians. Uh, the Australian government is committed to keeping Australians safe, including working with law enforcement and working with industry to achieve that. Uh, the information provided by telecommunication carriers to emergency services is essential to keeping people safe from harm and supporting investigations. Uh, Senator Lambie, as you may be aware, uh, the, there is an ability for telecommunications companies to recover costs of providing this kind of information. Uh, that, that ability is provided for under the Telecommunications Act, but it's limited in the sense that telecommunications carriers or carriage service providers cannot profit from the data they provide. So they are legally obtained to recover the cost of providing that information, but they can't profit. Uh, from that, and I think that's something that all Australians would agree with. This cost recovery model is a long-established framework in telecommunications law in our country, and the Albanese government certainly expects telecommunication providers to support our emergency services, our police services in these kinds of investigations, and we encourage them to provide information as soon as possible to support their needs. Uh, I think all of us have been very disturbed by this particular uh, incident. Uh, and it must be horrible for um, Ms Murphy's family uh, to have to go on day by day without her body being found. Uh, it is an extremely distressing incident, uh, not only for her family but for many others as well. And we would certainly be encouraging telecommunications providers to assist the police investigation in any way they possibly can. Thank you, Minister. What, Senator Lambie, first supplementary. It is not just the slow delivery of this data that is rowing, it is also the cost, which you have mentioned. And in 2022, Western Australian Police Commissioner Cole Blanche revealed telco fees for this crucial data had risen from 600000 in 2018-19 financial year to $1 million over a period of 12 months. Tasmanian police said they had spent 90000 on requests for data from telco's last financial year. Bottom line is this, Minister, you have a problem here, and I want to know how you are going to fix it. How are you going to fix it? Because they're obstructionists to an investigation. Your method Thank is you, not Senator. working. Thank you, How Senator are you fixing Lambie. it? Your time has expired. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Senator Lambie. Well, again, I, I understand that this has been reported in the media, and I guess I just want to be cautious about accepting that that is absolutely correct. But if it is correct, um, then, as I say, that is a real concern to us. Um, I've already made clear that our government expects telecommunications providers uh, to cooperate with police investigations, uh, to supply whatever data they have available to them to assist with that, and to follow the law in, in, in terms of what they charge for that. Um, under the Telecommunic Telecommunications Act, uh, telecoms providers are required to provide assistance to the Commonwealth, states or territories, uh, and they are required to provide such help as is reasonably necessary 
uh, for certain purposes, which include enforcing the criminal law. And as I've explained, under the, under the Act, providers must comply with that requirement on the basis that they neither profit from nor bear the costs of assisting those investigations. We expect the law to be upheld. We expect the telecommunications to comply, uh, providers to comply with the law. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. The Tele Telecommunication Act states that providers must, and I quote, neither, neither profits from nor bears the cost of, end quote, providing such assistance to policing authorities. Can the minister please tell the Senate why the minister isn't holding telcos to account with the provision of information this time critical to investigations? You are part of the problem. Answer the question. What are you going to do about it? It's not working. Uh, thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Thanks, President. Thanks, Senator Lambie. Uh, well, as I say, the Albanese government expects telecommunications providers to comply with the law, uh, and whatever action can be taken under the Telecommunications Act will be taken to ensure that that is the case. I must admit I haven't seen anything in terms of what's been reported uh, that the telecoms providers are overcharging for that data. If there is any evidence that that's the case, then I'd invite you to pre present that to us so action can be taken. Uh, as you've noted, Senator Lambie, under the Act, uh, providers are entitled to recover their costs of providing that, that, that data, but they're not entitled to profit, profit, from, us, uh, profit from that data. Um, if, uh, if it is the case that they are profiting from it, um, then we would be very interested in knowing about that, whether it's information that you have, media outlets or others as well, so that the appropriate action can be taken. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training, Senator Watt. I note that the Albanese government inherited one of the worst skill shortages in more than 50 years. How is the Albanese Labor government working to address those skill shortages, particularly in the areas of demand? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Thanks, President. Thanks, Senator Sheldon. And you're right, Senator Sheldon. I mean, how many messes have we had to clean up since coming to office? I know, I know you're embarrassed. I'd be embarrassed too if I had been in government for 10 years and left so many messes behind. It's like that advertisement with Pro Heart. Oh, Mr. Hart, what a mess! What a mess! Um, there's a mess everywhere you look. Every every rug you lift up, there's another mess left behind by the coalition government. And skills and training is one of them as well. Uh, and it won't surprise us that our old friend Senator Cash was the minister for skills and training for a period of time. Uh, our young friend. Our youthful friend, Senator Cash, leaving messes behind, including in the skills and training portfolio. And it is correct, Senator Sheldon, that the previous government left us with the worst skill shortages in five decades. And those skill shortages were as wide as they were deep. They spanned sectors right across our economy. Um, they're a bit, bit noisy, Order. President. They're a bit noisy, President. Um, the, uh, the, those opposite rotted our skills base leaving Australia without the care industry workers, the chefs, the tradies, the hairdressers, the cyber security experts and, Senator Stirl, the truckies as well. They left us without all those skills that we needed. And since coming to office, a key mission of our government has been to put TAFE back at the centre of the vocational education and training sector. Uh, and we're also supporting more people to start their careers in construction to support our ambitious housing targets. Uh, Australia does need more houses, and for that we need more tradies. And that's why this month we've confirmed our commitment to making housing a national priority under our landmark national skills agreement to support building 1.2 million new homes over the next five years. Senator Cash asks how that's going. I'll tell you how well it's going, Senator Cash. You couldn't negotiate a skills agreement with the states and territories while you were in government. We've now uh, got one you, and it's Senator delivering. Watt. Thank you, Senator Watt. Be order. 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 Before I call you, Senator Sheldon, I will remind you, Minister, to please address the President in your response. Uh, Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Thank you, President. In the context of a very tight labour market with low unemployment and cost of living pressures, how is the Albanese Labor government helping Australians skill up into better paid, more secure work without being saddled with study related debt? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Senator Sheldon. And as Senator Wong has outlined today already, the Albanese government has taken a range of actions to assist Australians deal with cost of living pressures, whether that be cheaper childcare, cheaper medicine, uh, the energy price uh, relief that the opposition voted against, 
Uh, we've got the tax cuts coming in on the 1st of July, but another cost of living measure that we're taking is providing fee-free TAFE. And I think that is one of the unsung heroes in terms of the cost of living relief that we've provided since coming to office. Fee-free TAFE means that the students no longer will have big study-related debts once they finish, and because courses are in areas of demand, they go into long-term and secure work. We've seen high uptake in nursing, early childhood education and care, community and individual care, electrotechnology, electrical, cyber security and IT, to name just a few of the careers that people are taking up those fee-free fee uh, TAFE options. Uh, and that's giving Australians access to education and providing uh, the skills you, that we need. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. I know that many areas of the Order. I know that many areas of the economy most in need of workers are lower paid jobs like early childhood education and aged care. How is the Albanese Labor government helping those workers keep more of what they earn once they enter the workforce? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Thanks, uh, President, and thanks, Senator Sheldon. I will come to the tax cuts, but it's just occurred to me that maybe we need to offer another fee-free TAFE course, and that is how to do some work in opposition, because we know, we know that this is a group uh, who clearly don't have the skills or the work ethic to get a job. Uh, and that's why, in all the time they've been in opposition, they've only come up with one policy, and that's to put in place nuclear reactors all over the country. And are we seeing them all walk away slowly from that one? Um, so maybe a new fee-free TAFE course uh, to assist you get, you, you get the skills that you need. Under the Albanese Labor government, there are more people in jobs, they're earning more, and with our tax plan, they'll keep more of what they earn. Remember what I was saying yesterday? Under the Albanese government, workers get to earn Order. more and keep Order. more of what they earn. And under the Liberals, what happens? They work more and earn less. You will learn the words before long, because it's true, and you know it's true, and that's why you ended up voting for our tax cuts, although from what Senator Birmingham had to say, had to say today, we're not Thank so sure you, anymore. Senator Watt. Uh, Senator MacDonald. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources, Senator Farrell. Last week's gas statement of opportunities highlighted an imminent risk of gas shortfalls. Minister, Labor today voted against bringing its own legislation to the Senate, despite having bipartisan support for it from the coalition. You have thrown the offshore gas industry into uncertainty, caused further delay by blocking your own legislation, despite claiming that this bill was urgent and desperately needed. What deal have you done with the Greens for their votes? Order. 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 Order, particularly on my right. Order. Senator McGrath. Minister, uh, Minister Watt, when you've stopped interjecting, interjecting, I've called you to answer the question. I'll oh, beg your pardon, it's Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, Sorry. and uh, thank the Senator the for her question. None. Hey. Uh, Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. Minister, it was revealed on Monday and, to and today the government threw away bipartisan support for gas regulation changes and bowed to pressure to secure green votes by giving the Environment Minister another EPBC Order. trigger. Labor is clearly divided. Which factional power brokers in Labor supported the Environment Minister to overrule the Resources Minister? Before I call the minister, I'll remind those on my right that Senator Macdonald has the right to ask her question in silence. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, President, and uh, thank uh, the senator for her uh, question. Um, um, well, look, there's, I'm not sure how to answer. I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question because there's nothing, nothing in your question that re remotely resembles the, uh, the truth or remotely uh, resembles what's, uh, what's been happening in this place. It's the, it's, the combination, it's the combination of the Greens and the Coalition which is stopping progress on, uh, on all of these things. Now, now <coughs> can I say this about, can I say this about uh, um, Minister uh, Madeleine uh, King? Um, Fine minister. Very, very fine minister, but, but more importantly, resources, 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 and especially gas 
are in very safe hands. From, from, from the time that your former Thank government you, came the to— the time for answering has expired. Senator MacDonald, second supplementary. West Australian wrote that thanks to the Labor Environment Action Network complaining to Minister Plibersek and the Prime Minister, Minister King was embarrassingly forced to change her own legislation. It is clear that Minister King has been sidelined and the Lean Green Alliance is now actually responsible for Labor's resources policy. When will you give up the charade and promote Mr Bant to Cabinet? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank, you. thank you, President. Uh, uh, well, again, 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 again there is nothing, nothing in your question uh, that uh, resembles uh, reality or the truth, the truth of the situation. And I, I, can only, I can only repeat what I said in my uh, previous um, answer, that um, we have one of the finest uh, resources minister that this country, that this country has ever Order. had. And can I say this? Can I say this about gas? When, when was the first report that we had gas shortages? It was the year Tony Abbott. It was the year Tony Abbott became the prime minister. And what has happened? What happened in those nine years? You did absolutely nothing about securing gas supplies in this country. We are doing something about that. We will do something about it. And there is no better person to do it Thank than you, Madeleine King. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And on that note, I'd ask that further questions be taken on notice. Thank you. Thank you.